Thank you, Helen. So uh, Helen asked me a couple of weeks ago if I could do another deep dive talk on a basal topic. Um, and so we thought about this a little bit and, and I thought maybe basal test is a good thing to deep dive in because it turns out that basal test has a lot of features. Um, and so I just made up a quick list and I thought, yeah, there are eight things I can talk about here, no problem. Um, and so I was preparing the talk. It turns out there are more than eight advanced features. Uh, according to the Basel documentation, there are 13, at least. I may have missed some. Um, <laughs> and then as part of the preparation, I also tried out every single feature to make sure that it actually works as I'm talking about it here. Uh, and it turns out some of them don't work that way. <laughs> so um, the number of useful features is around nine-ish. So that's why I had to adjust the title a little bit. Um, Yes, for for those who don't know me, um, I have to I have to put up this background slide here. Uh, I'm contributed to Basil a little bit, um, just you know, ten years or so. Uh, I was working on Basil before it became an open source project. I was the tech lead and also the manager of the team uh, at Google, and so I have. A little bit of background. Um, that doesn't mean I know everything. And actually, you will see there is at least one slide, which is basically empty because I have no idea. Uh, so, but I, you know, if 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 you have any basic questions, um, I may be able to find out the answer. Uh, and and as part of this talk, I actually dig into some of the basic source code just to double check if it's implemented the way I think it's implemented, because the documentation is always completely to the point. So in terms of content, um, we have the Bazel test model, which I'm going to cover briefly. So this is how Bazel treats tests, what, what Bazel thinks of as a test. Um, then I'm going to talk very briefly about the philosophy of approaching clicky tests. There are two basic ways of doing that. Um, I don't, there is no right or wrong there, but I just want to bring you into the mindset of what to do about clicky tests because of a lot of the features uh, in basal tests are related to flakiness. And then we have not eight, not nine, but 13 different things that are documented in basal documentation uh, that we can briefly talk about. Uh, I've tried to give as many examples of how to use these things and screenshots and terminal views. So this is as hands on as I can make it, uh, apart from it being a live demo, which I decided against, um, and <laughs> I have to say, fortunately decided against, because yesterday my, my laptop acted up and I couldn't build anymore. So that would have been a disaster if that happened today. All right, so when we talk about Bazel tests, what, what does, I mean, Bazel is a build system. What does it do with, with tests? So from Bazel's perspective, a test is a, an executable binary that it runs, and then it looks at the exit code. And if the exit code is zero, the test passed. And if it's not zero, the test fails. And that is the basic model. And that means you can basically do whatever we want in your test, right? It's just an arbitrary executable. You can bring up infrastructure, or you can do whatever you want, really. Um, now. There are a lot of optional features in Bazel test, and that is the majority of the talk. But they're all optional. This is the minimum that your test has to do, right? And if you are, you know, if you are conversant in Bash shell or in some other scripting language, you know, writing a test is very simple. You just write a script that returns a zero or non-zero exit step. And this is what it looks like, right? If I run Bazel test in a terminal with an example, um, Bazel will print out that it found a test target. It will actually build it. Uh, the, output, the output of the test target is the binary. And then Bazel, on top of that, runs the binary. Um, and it will show you that the binary passed, well, in this case, passed with zero exit steps. Sometimes test targets have more than one output. So for example, if this is an SH test, uh, 
there would also be a second file here. I omitted some of the details uh, to make it clearer what's going on and to, you know, to put a focus on what is important and what isn't important. And then, of course, you could have a UI, which you should, could show your test results. Uh, this happens to be the Edgeflow UI because, uh, well, I worked there, sorry. Um, this is an overview of, of the build. In this case, I didn't just build a single build target, but I actually built an entire subtree. You can see at the top, I built slash slash Java slash dot dot dot. Um, and then we have sort of a list of targets that were built. There are actually two targets that were built, only one of which was a test. And then we can look at the test results and the test file. Perfect. Now we can open up the test. We can sort of bring that test result to the, like maximize it at full screen. Um, and I did that for all of the future slides. I'm not showing the overall build status anymore, but I'm always focusing on specific test results. Um, so you can see what happens here. Uh, this is already a little bit advanced, uh, right? This is more than a basic test. It actually had some of the advanced features that we're going to talk about, but this is basically what it looks like. So what else is there, and how can Bazel Test have optional features? So the optional features in Bazel Test are pretty much all designed such that Bazel Test sets a number of environment variables that the test can use to do something interesting, to generate specific output, to generate structured output, unstructured output, and a number of other things. And you can see these environment variables if you run Bazel test with the dash s flag, which is the shorthand, shorthand for dash dash subcommand. Is there an s at the end? I don't know. Uh, dash s is the shorthand. Um, now, actually, when you pass dash s, it will give you every single action that Bazel runs. So if you do this for a large tree, you might get a little bit inundated with output. Um, if you do this, if you really want to see this, you know, for a specific example test, I, I recommend only passing the single test that you're interested in at that time. And so we can see some of these environment variables. There are actually more that Bazel sets, but these are some of the ones that are uh, important for the for the advanced features that we have. Um, we're going to go into these in detail in the rest of the talk, right? You don't have to memorize them. This is just an example to show how you can see what Bazel does, right? If you need to crack it open and see what it does under the covers, dash s is uh, your friend. I've been I've been using dash s so often. I, as a Bazel engineer, I just I use this every day, right? Just to see what was the actual command that was run. What was the environment variable exactly set to? Oh, that one. Okay. So there is another thing. Um, most tests, I mean, from Bazel's perspective, all the tests are just an executable. But almost all tests are written with a specific test framework, right? If you write tests in Java, you're most likely using JUnit. If you're writing tests in C++, you're most likely using GUnit. Pretty much every language comes with its own test framework that you can use for testing. Um, and so the, the test executable, if we like zoom in a little bit, um, we can distinguish between the test framework, which is most likely, I mean, some of you may write your own test framework, which is cool. Uh, but if you're just, just using an existing test framework, um, then you would only write the test code, not the framework code. And this is relevant because some of the features are better implemented in the test framework and are not easy to implement in the test code itself. Uh, again, if you're writing just a generic binary, you can do whatever you want and you can do all the things. But if you're using existing test framework, your approach may be to either have, to, you know, it, and you want to use some of the advanced features, you could file a feature request against the people who wrote the test framework, or you could try to patch it yourself or do something else. But implementing some of these things in the test itself is, I, it's always possible, but it may not really be the right level of abstraction. Okay, so let's briefly talk about flaky tests. 
everyone has seen flaky tests. Um, and they can be very painful, especially the larger an organization, the more painful they usually are. Um, and there are two basic approaches, sort of philosophical approaches to tests, to flaky tests. One is we don't allow flaky tests. If something ever flakes, we file a bug immediately and we fix it right now, drop everything else and fix it immediately. And that works. There are people who do this successfully. Don't think this doesn't work. This does work, absolutely. Um, and this was from Basel, you know, when I started to work on Basel, this was sort of the, the, the opinion I came in with. And over time, you know, working in a very large organization, I realized that this isn't necessarily, well, oh, 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 is, this isn't necessarily the right approach for every organization, especially for very large organizations where people run tests that they're not directly responsible for, that they didn't write themselves, that are written by some other team on the other side of the planet, right? In that case, a better approach may be to accept that there is a level of flakiness in your tests and then manage that. And there are features in Bazel that were specifically added to support the management of flaky tests. Um, and the idea here is basically, instead of you know, accepting that tests fail and that don't fail, uh, we retry the flaky tests a number of times. Uh, and if, if it passes at least once, we say, yeah, that's fine. We'll not look into it any deeper. Um, but then in, on top of that, you need a process to fix a flaky test. Because what we've seen in the past, at least in my experience, and I mean, yours may differ, but in my experience, flaky tests usually don't become less flaky over time but usually become either more flaky over time or more flaky tests are added to your code base. Um, and so you need to have a second process where you create incentives for people to fix the flakiness in their tests. And that can be very simple. It could be just, you know, sometimes people file bugs and then things get fixed eventually. Or you could have a, you know, a flakiness week where you just get together for a couple of days and say, okay, this time we're going to fix all the flaky tests. Good luck. Um, or you could have like a high score, like a score list. This is the most flaky test in the company. Uh, you could even like put a number on it, right? This is causing 10% of builds to fail or 10% of pre-submits have, have this flaky test that it's causing this much, you know, lost productivity in the company. I, it doesn't have to be an exact number, but, you know, we can get an idea, right? And some tests are better than others. Um, and so that you can use that to prioritize which tests to fix. And you can also use that as sort of a, a little bit of a gamification where you say, you know, the top fixers will, I don't know, get gummy bears or, well, that works for my kids. Like, maybe not for, for everyone, but there you go. All right. And with that, we get to the first advanced step feature. And it is. Premature exit detection. So, what is it? Sometimes um, you have code that calls system.exit or exit, you know, depending on language. And ideally, you want that test to fail rather than to pass, right? You're trying to detect false passes of tests. And the way to do that, well, I mean, that's already the why. The way to do that is basically to create a file at the beginning of the, the, the test invocation and then delete it at the end of the test invocation. And then Bazel knows that the file exists when the test is complete. It wasn't the test framework that exited, but it was something else that exited. And Bazel can tell you, oh, something went wrong in your test. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. I tried to get it to work for a while, but right now in Basel, unfortunately, it doesn't work. I looked at the code. It's not hooked up anywhere. Um, how did that happen? Um, that happened because we were, as we were open sourcing Basel, uh, Google had its own test strategy implementation, which was tied to Google's internal infrastructure. And so we basically forked that, or we rewrote it uh, as an open source version. Um, and while we did that, we didn't cover all of the features in Bagel test. So this was one of them that, I'm sorry, I dropped it. There you go. 
All right, the second one is pretty straightforward, unstructured logs. It's really very simple. Bazel will just capture all the standard out and standard error from your test process while it's running. You don't have to do anything. It's completely automatic. You use it, well, <laughs> if you need to debug a test failure. Uh, terminal output, and the, the way to use it is just write stuff to send it out and send it out. Um, that's it. So I don't have any examples for that because it's really so straightforward. Structured logs. Um, this is the quote from the documentation. The structured split logs, whatever that is exactly, is an absolute path to a private file in a writable directory where you can write log splitter proto buffer log file. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find the proto buffer file for this, so I think it's not open source. And Bazel also doesn't do anything with this. And certainly, I'm not exactly sure what this actually does. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, um, that you can use this to split the log into the logs for different test cases. Right? If your test executable runs five or six or 10 or 100 different test cases in the same test executable run, um, and it, they all write log output, right? in many cases, you just get the log output for everything as a giant file. Right? And with split logs, you can actually associate each, each part of the log output to each test case that was running at the time, which can be very useful, except it doesn't work. Sorry. Um, yeah, on a related note, I hope that in a year from now, uh, we can hold this talk again. Um, and it will not be nine, but it will be 13 working features. That's, that's one of my goals for the next year. There, I said it. <laughs> All right, and with that, we come to the next structured output, um, which is test XML files. And some of you may have seen those already. Um, there, is a, there is a myth that these were invented for JUnit. They were not invented for JUnit. They were invented for Ant. Um, Ant was running JUnit tests, and it wanted to have a structured output for the test results. And so they invented the XML format. Now, the good thing is, at this point, this is supported by a lot of different CI systems. It's basically an industry standard. Uh, pretty much every test framework supports it. I mean. JUnit doesn't support it, which is funny. Um, but if you're running Java tests with Bazel, the test runner that ships with Bazel actually generates test XML output from it. Um, GUnit supports it. Plenty of other languages support it as well. One of the weird things about this format is there is no specification for the test XML file. So that's not entirely ideal. Um, but there is standard usage. Uh, so if you're looking for examples, You'll find standard usage, and it's probably going to work good enough. Um, we had one customer that was generating test XML files that was using some esoteric features in test XML files. And so we had to adjust our own parser for it to actually work with that. So what can Bazel do with that? Um, so if you run Bazel in a terminal, what you can do is you can set test summary equal detail. And unfortunately, this is not enabled by default, as far as I'm aware, which is a shame, because it's really useful. Uh, so what happens is when you see the test results, Bazel can actually crack open your test target and tell you the red is hard to read. OK, um, there is some red here. Um, Bazel can tell you not just that the test target failed, but also that within the test target, the fizz test failed. Uh, and this comes from the FizzBuzz uh, coding problem, which we've used for our example tests here. And then, of course, it can also tell you that there were more tests in the class. There were actually four tests. Three of them passed. One of them failed. Um, and again, if you look at the UI view, the UI will actually sort the failed tests to the top. So you get immediately, yeah, this is the, the failed test. right? If you have not just Four, but if you have hundreds of them, then having the, exact, the, the errors at the top, of course, makes it a lot easier to read. And then if you um, 
you can you can see the, the sort of the diamond arrows here that means you can actually like pop it open and pop it closed um, so you don't have to look at everything at the same time that's something you can do in a browser but it's not something you can do in a terminal at least not in today's terminals I, I hear there are people working on advanced terminals so maybe that will be possible in the future um, and then of course once you fix it all of them pass perfect so next topic is test filters. Um, the, in, in your test framework, usually your tests have names, right? In Java, it's a, the method name. In C++, you can give it a name. Um, and sometimes you're working on something, right? And you have this one failing test, and you really you want to run it again and again to see if you can fix it. Now, let's say you have 200 test cases in your test binary, and each of them takes a second, then it takes 200 seconds for all of your tests to run. But you only care about this one test case. And test filter is one way to do that. So um, the way to use it uh, is to tell Bazel, to give pass Bazel the test filter flag, which takes a regular expression. Um, there are some caveats here. Which is that, of course, every language has its own regular expression library. And so you have to be a little bit careful with how you write your expression here. And also, when you do that on the, on the terminal command line, you also have to make sure to quote it correctly so that you don't like accidentally get globbing of files in your directory or something like that. Um, and in any case, uh, what Bazel does then is pass that to the test framework or to the test executable by setting the test bridge test only environment variable. This is the only one that starts with test bridge, all the other ones start with test, except the one for XML output, which, start, which is just XML output. So it's a little bit inconsistent, but what can you do? So on the terminal command line, it looks like this, and you can actually combine this with the test XML with the structured output. Um, and so I change it here to just run the buzz test, and it just ran the bus test, and we can see only a single test was run, and it passed. So apparently, I got everything fixed. So that's nice. In the UI, it's the same, right? Instead of showing you four test cases, and now only shows you one test case. Um, it says here that it ran four tests, which is a bit of a lie, I guess. Um, it only ran one test and skipped three. So that sums up to four, obviously. So that's all right, I guess. All right, next up, undeclared outputs. So one of the key features in Bazel is that everything it runs has inputs and output types. And because of the history of Bazel and its usage inside of Google, all of the output files have to be declared in Bazel. Uh, you can't just return whatever, whatever output was written to the file system, but you have to give it names of output files. Um, it's a little bit, actually, it's, you know, it's a little bit simplified, but that's basically what it is. And so for tests, um, before this feature was introduced, there was no way for tests to produce any kind of output to return to the user. And so this was added. Um, and this can be, there are cases where this is just incredibly useful. Um, and the, my, my favorite example is when you have UI tests that actually bring up a browser and they can take a screencast of the browser and then basically return a video of how the browser ran the test. And that's just so incredibly useful, right? It means you cannot just run your browser tests, but you can debug them <laughs> after they fail. And you can actually also, if you have remote execution, you can run them on multiple platforms, multiple browsers, multiple platforms, and you get very nice visual results of what happened there. Um, Using it is very simple. Um, you can do it through the test framework, or you can just ignore the test framework. And for you know, in a test, you can write the files. You should make sure that you write files with different names, right? Um, you could just generate a random ID or something for the files. That's fine from Bazel's perspective because tests are. I'm getting a little bit in in the deep here. Uh, <laughs> um, usually, Bazel users don't like um, 
generating random file names, and for good reason, because it can make the build non-deterministic. Now, when you have a test generating files, the test in Basil is, is considered a leap of, of the dependency tree. And so as long as there's nothing depending on it, these, these random file names cannot pollute any downstream action. Um, anyway, uh, some notes about undeclared outputs. Um, Basil, as I said before, Basil requires to list every file name. Um, that is actually not true anymore. Basil can actually, you can actually give it like an output directory and then pull all the files in the output directory if you're running remote execution. Um, except this predates the feature in Basil where you can give it an output directory. And so the way it was implemented at the time was to zip up all of the undeclared output files into a zip file. Um, I'm hoping that we can fix that at some time. This has been on my bucket list for a long time. Um, there is a flag for that now. Thank you, Benjamin. Awesome. So maybe next next time we can say it just worked. Um, and then, of course, if you have a UI, you can, you know, hopefully the UI will do something useful with your undeclared output files. Um, and as an additional feature, you can also pass back mind type information. So you know, whoever receives the data can do something useful with it. I'm, in most cases, the file extension is probably going to be fine. Uh, here's what it looks like in the terminal, right? We ran a test, and the test generated some undeclared outputs, and we have uh, a zip file, and we can list the files in the zip file. And in this case, I generated a fake data.json file and a fake screencast.mp4. Test warnings. Next up, number seven. OK, sometimes tests do more than just test stuff. Uh, sometimes you have linting tests, right, for example. And maybe the linter knows that something is going to change in the future and can tell you before it actually happens, right? can give you a warning. This is going to break in the next release or something like that. Or sometimes your test framework can do that, or sometimes you can do uh, dynamic analysis inside your test, right? You run some code, you do dynamic analysis on the code while it's running, uh, and the test can generate a warning for that. And there is a test warnings output file, which you can write to. Unfortunately, the file format is undocumented, and Basil doesn't do anything with the file right now. Um, it does post it to the build event protocol, so in theory, if you have a UI that is attached to the build event protocol, it can do something useful with it, but I'm unfortunately not aware of any UI that does that today. So my recommendation right now is not to use it yet, um, but hopefully that will also be fixed in the future. Infrastructure failures, number eight. So now we're going more into integration tests. Infrastructure failures aren't something that should happen in your normal unit test. But once you start thinking about integration tests, and thinking about bringing up extra infrastructure for your test, right? Maybe you bring up a VM in AWS, or you run a Docker container. And sometimes the tool that you're using, or the library, or whatever, fails. And you know it's not your fault, and it's something you can't easily fix. Then the test infrastructure failure file is your friend. Um, again, um, the, this time, the format is documented, just a plain text format with one line naming the component that failed, and then another line for the error message. Unfortunately, again, Basil doesn't do anything with it. So not recommended right now. Hopefully, that will be fixed in the future. Number nine, run files. Um, so I said earlier that for Basil, your test is just a symbol executable. And that's not entirely correct. Um, in fact, Basil. Um, constructs a tree of input files for your test. Um, and the way that you can add input files to that tree is by, the typical way is by using the data attribute. If you're writing your own rules, you can also generate your own run files tree. Uh, you can put into it basically whatever you, you like, as long as it's declared input. Uh, and then within the test, you can access those files and I, I saw during my test that at least in the latest Basil versions, the test 
is running in the root of that tree. So you can just use relative paths to address the files and everything that works. Um, previously, there was a test underscore source dear environment variable that had the, the full paths to that run files directory. Um, but it looks like, at least going forward, that may no longer be necessary. Uh, if you're on an old Bazel version, you may need to check uh, which of the two is actually, whether you need to use test source here or not. Now, what we have discovered after a lot of usage of tests and run files and uh, lots of people writing these things is there is one typical pitfall, uh, which is you, over time, you add more and more tests, and you add more and more run files to your tests. The tests become bigger and bigger. Um, and each test comes with its own run files directory. Now, the run files directory only contains symlinks. Bazel doesn't actually copy the files. It only symlinks the files. But still means that you may end up with a very large number of symlinks. Right? If you have 100 tests with 100 files, we're talking about did I say 100 times 100 is 10,000 symlinks, right? If it's 1,000 times 1,000, it's a million symlinks, right? These things multiply, unfortunately. Um, and we have seen that this can, can end up making, especially making your fully cached builds very slow. Because even for fully cached builds, they will have to create all the run file trees only then to just discover that the test was already run and has a result. It, it first creates a run file tree, and then it checks the cache. That's how it, it's implemented, implemented today. Um, what can we do about that? Um, there is one additional feature here, uh, which it has for tests, which is the test unused run files log file which contains a list of unused files in your test run. Now, it's not super easy to generate that accurately, and you probably can't do it in your test code itself, but you may be able to do it in your test framework. Um, there are a few caveats there. The better place to generate this file is in your remote execution system. Uh, which can basically monitor which files were accessed during its run, and then basically say, all right, not these, but everything else goes into the file. Um, now, let's see what I have on the next slide. No, OK. Um, unfortunately, Bazel doesn't do anything with this file. Um, but if you generate it, at least you can look at it when you need to or your UI can uh, post-process it and give you insights about you know, what are the most common unused files in your, in your run file trees. There is a question back there from Christian. Is there a sane way to list all of the run files um, before you run a test so we can generate that unused run file log file if we're not using a web execution? I'm not sure I completely caught that. Um, the easy way to, to list all the run files in your test is to just run the find command in your source tree uh, while the test is running. That's the easy way to get the list. That's what I always do, right? I write a simple shell test. I list all the files just to see what's in there. Um, but, but you can do that in any, any language, right? It doesn't have to be shell. Uh, oh, we also, I'm just going to read it out. There's a question from Jesse Shulkin. Uh, regarding what you just said before, can this be alleviated by splitting test targets up with their own specific run files? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if you can, if you can split test targets and give them a smaller list of run files, then then that's of course good. Um, but what what we see unfortunately is that you you have like a low level library that that comes with a data dependency, and then you have a lot of tests depending on that, and the run files from that library end up in every single test that depends on it. Um, and this could be something like a Khmer Dictionary. What? Why a Khmer Dictionary? The ICU Unicode library comes with a bunch of different language dictionaries, which are usually not used at all. 
but I'm still shipped for everything. And so the, the, the Khmer Dictionary is one of the things that we found uh, that was literally a lot of unused run files. But removing it from the ITU is not really possible because you don't know who's actually using it. And you may only find out at runtime. And, and then, of course, it depends on your policy. It, you know, you have sufficient test coverage so that you can check if removing the file will break things or not. Um, another option is, if you're using remote execution, you can set no build run file links. And the interesting side effect of this flag is it only applies to local execution. So if you're Bazel no longer creates the symlink trees locally, but when you when Bazel runs a test in remote execution, the remote executor still creates those trees, and so the tests work just fine. Now, unfortunately, if you have some tests that are tagged as local, or you sometimes fall back to local execution, then those tests no longer work because they have no idea where the files are because they're not there. This is a little bit unfortunate, and I hope this is something we can fix at some point. Um, the way that... Yeah, we've got a question from Jesse again. Why does Bazel only check the test cache over after building the run files tree? Uh, yeah, that's how it's implemented. <laughs> because running the test depends on building the run files tree. So it's just an artifact of how dependency checking works. Yeah, I, you know, well, when I mentioned it in this talk, I thought, well, maybe we could do it the other way around. Um, but it's not entirely straightforward um, because of some of the features that we'll get to. So what I, the last thing I wanted to say on this slide is it's a little bit unfortunate that, that no build run file links works this way um, because Bazel actually knows that it's going to run your test locally and it could figure out that if it's running the test locally, it has to create the run file tree, but skip the run file tree creation if it's not going to run locally. You could mitigate that with different run profiles or configs, right, for local tests and for remote. Yeah, yeah. You can, you can do it manually, but of course, that's not ideal, right? Bazel has all the information. Why doesn't it do it automatically? And in fact, inside of Google, the Bazel version that Google uses internally does do just in time run file tree generation, except the open source Bazel version doesn't work. So I'm hoping that we can fix it at some point. I, I look at the specific code that's doing it, and it's a it's a big hack. And unfortunately, that hack we couldn't do in Bazel. And so I skipped it at the time and didn't implement it. Uh, but it was always in the back of my mind how can we, you know, what's the right, right way to implement it in Bazel? Um, and unfortunately, we haven't got to it. Test sharding. Number 10. Yeah, this is quite a long list. All right, so what is test charting? Uh, it's a way to run the same test executable multiple times um, and set some additional environment variables, specifically test chart index and test total charts. Now, that sounds stupid. Why would you want to run the test multiple times? Um, in this case, this feature specifically is designed to run subsets of your test cases in each shard, right? So let's say you have four test cases. Each takes 10 seconds, for incidental example. And so you enter a test run, take 40 seconds. Um, maybe you can run each test in a separate process. Um, and if you have enough CPU, then it only takes 10 seconds. How to use it? This requires help from your test framework. But basically, you need to list all of the test cases in your binary. You have to sort them fully deterministically. Um, and in particular, and I'm, I'm emphasizing this because it's a bug that we encounter, uh, even if you have test cases with the same name, you have to sort them deterministically. Because if you have two shards and you split the order, then it's possible that you can end up in a situation where test cases are not run at all, um, or at least one of them isn't run at all. The other one may still be run, but twice, which is not what you want. Um, and then you, you basically, once you've listed them, you, know, you can use some deterministic strategy to pick a subset of the test, right? The easiest way is to just 
um, take each index, modulo the total chart, number of total charts, and then see if that's equal to the index that this specific test chart is running. Um, but there are other ways to do that as well, right? Maybe you know more about your tests. Maybe you know some of your tests are very quick to run and some of them are slower to run. Then maybe you want to do this for all the fast tests and separately also do it for the slower tests so you get a better distribution of slow and fast tests across different charts, right? The downside with the charting approach is if you have a single test that is very slow and the others are fast, then charting doesn't give you anything because the slowest chart is still as long as the entire test run. Um, another thing that you can do there is to split up your tests. This is often considered a best practice that you don't mix tests that have very different runtimes in the same executable, but you, you put your test integration tests in a separate executable than your unit tests. There is a question there. Um, so basically here, the idea is that you split your test to be faster, but you decide how to split them before you run them, right? Yes. Um, is it possible to distribute these tests while execution is taking place? So for example, you have 400 tests and you have four test runners. You don't want to split them beforehand because maybe you have one test runner running for three hours and the other three running for half an hour because you don't know how, how long your tests are taking. But what you want is to, okay, I have four runners, and while in runtime, start distributing like, okay, one test finish, I give you one test. Bazel doesn't support that today, um, but there have been a number of proposals for how to make this smarter. Another option is to actually store the, the average runtime of each test after each run, and then adjust the sharding depending on how long the tests take, um, so you get a more even weighting. Um, but also something that Bazel doesn't support today. And there are some tricky parts here where you, you want to make sure that you get cache hits if the test was run before. Um, and so, so storing data in a way that is a test input can invalidate caching in Bezos model. Um, so you want to be careful with that. Uh, so right now it's completely static. Um, another thing that people have done is to build an automated tool that goes over all the tests in your repository and automatically adjust the sharding. Run the, basically run the test a few times and automatically adjust the sharding and then check that into the build file or into a separate data file so that that can be used for, for test sharding. Um, so this is, um, this is the uncharted test run. Here it takes 43 seconds to run this test. There are four test cases. Each takes around 10 seconds. Um, and that it happened to be the case because I put a spread dot sleep in there, which was for 10 seconds. Now, if I modify the build file, I add this one line, chart count equals four. And then I run the test again, and the UI shows me there are four shards here for the same run. Okay, we get to that. Um, and each, each shard only has a single test, and each shard takes 10 seconds. Now, the downside is, if you look at the number at the top, it says 52 seconds. The, every test has a certain overhead. Um, and my, my rule of thumb for Java is that JVM takes about a second to start up, right? So if you shard a test into more, if you, if you shard it into more shards, um, then you spend startup overhead on every shard, right? But it, it doesn't have to be JVM startup overhead. It could also be anything your test is doing before it starts running test cases. That could be some kind of setup, it could be bringing up a Postgres instance, it could be running a Docker image, whatever. There is another question here. But isn't this startup also taking, taking place in parallel? So it actually should take only the one second? Yes, so um, I think the key question here is how much, how much CPU resources do you have? And how much are you willing to spend on potentially shorter end-to-end -end test times? Um, right? If you're running on a single machine, does it make sense to shard? In some cases, yes. Right? Maybe you have a very large test that has, I don't know, 10 test cases. They all take very long. And this test is always the slowest part of your build. Sharding it 
and running some of those tests in parallel, even on a single machine, because your machine is actually dual or quad core machine, uh, may, may reduce your end-to-end -end build time, even if your total CPU time goes up a little bit. Certainly, if you have a remote execution system, the incremental time you spend on each chart is usually negligible. Um, but when you have, a, so in that case, you can, you, you often chart very heavily, right? If you have remote execution, you have multiple machines, you just chart it very heavily. Um, there are different ways to do that. One recommendation that I sometimes give is if your test takes longer than five minutes, chart it, right? It, it depends a little bit on how long your build is, right? If your build is 20 minutes, um, and you have a test that takes longer than five minutes, it's probably a good idea to shard that. Because that will, there is very good, like, the very good chance that that will reduce your, compress your 20 minute end to end time. Um, but if, you're, if your test is you know, only a small fraction of the end to end build time, because there are other heavy steps in there, like packaging or whatever, it may not be, it may not be useful to shard a test. Now, that doesn't take into account sometimes as an engineer, you run the same test over and over. Um, and so maybe you want that to be sharded because this is a test that you just run very commonly and making that faster is worth whatever overhead you're paying. But it's tricky, right? It, there is overhead. It's not free. It's not completely free to shard. Um, it's often a good idea, but not always. And you have to figure out the balance. Number 11, runs per test. Wait, wait, didn't we just talk about multiple runs? OK, this is a different feature. Um, the, this, again, runs the same test executable multiple times. Uh, and it also sets an environment variable. Um, but in this case, it runs everything multiple times. And this, the, the, the main purpose of this feature is to detect if your test is flaky, if your test is randomly flaky, right? There are different kinds of flakiness. For example, if your test downloads a binary from a third party service, and the third party service is unavailable, all your tests will fail. These are correlated failures. Um, compare that to random failures, where the, the pass or fail of your test depends on, say, thread ordering, right? These are usually uncorrelated. Um, and so runs per test is a way to detect these kinds of uncorrelated failures. Um, another thing you can do with that is to just generate some load on your remote execution service to see how it behaves. Um, at one point, I ran about 100,000 test instances in parallel in about 30 seconds. So that was pretty cool. This can also be combined with pretty much all of the other features. Uh, and we'll see how that works. Um, there's another interesting one. All right. I the last comment on the slide is about runs per test detect flakes. And we talk, I will talk about that a little bit later. Um, so not going to go into detail here. One note is runs per test disables caching. Again, the idea is you want to use it to detect flakiness. And if you want it to, to detect flakiness, you actually want to run the test, right? You don't want to get a cache it. And so by default, Setting runs per test implicitly, implicitly disables caching. If the flag cache test results is set to auto, if it's set to true, then it's still cached, right? So you can still get cached run per test if you explicitly enable that. And that is turned out to be useful, uh, as we'll get, we'll get to that in, in, in a bit. So this is what it looks like. Um, I just ran this test five times in parallel. There we go. Oh, one of them failed, right? One of them was flaky. Uh, well, actually, I, I coded it up so that the fourth, specifically the fourth run would fail, right? Because Bezos passes an environment variable, we can actually tell which run we're in, and so we can intentionally fail like on the fourth run or something like that. But that was just for the demonstration. All right, now if we add runs per test to take flakes, the, the result for the test is now a flaky result. So Bezos distinguishes between a, a fail, a pass, and a flake. Now the flake only comes into play, there are two cases where it comes into play. This is one of them. If you set runs per test to take flakes, and you, you set runs per test to a non, to number larger than one, an integer larger than one, um, 
then it will use that to, to compute the test, the overall test status as flaky. We can go back once more, right? Here you can see the text says test failed. One or more test runs failed in 14 seconds. And here it says tests completed. And it also, the color indicates the same in the terminal. The terminal color also indicates that the test was flaky, not considered failed. And this is the strategy that I mentioned earlier when I talked about flaky tests. This is the management strategy, right? You can use this to manage your, your flaky tests. So you can run them multiple times in parallel, um, and then it will, it will not show up as failed. It will show up as flaky uh, in, your, in your Bazel terminal and, and also in your UI, if you have one. This is a combination of the two features. So I said chart count equal two and run per test equals two. So we end up with four runs. And I made it so that this one fails flakily in exactly 50% of the cases. Now, there is another feature when you use runs per test. And that is random seeds. It turns out, on top of setting the, the run count as an environment variable, Basil also sets an environment variable it calls test random seed. So why would you use that? And unfortunately, I wasn't able to come up with a description in one sentence. So I'm going to tell you a story instead, because I have your attention. So at some point, I wrote a, a binary tree implementation, like a basic data, data structure, uh, based on red flag trees. It's not complicated. Um, but the key is when you, when you insert something into a binary tree, sometimes you have to rotate nodes in the tree to balance it out, right? You want the height of the tree to be limited, and so you have to make some changes to the tree. And the changes in the tree depend on the order in which you insert elements in the tree, right? So, for example, you insert numbers. If you insert four, five, six, you have to rotate this way. If you insert six, five, four, you have to rotate the other way. Uh, that's just how the data structure works. Now, you can cover that with test cases, and you can use coverage to figure out if you've covered all of the corner cases. But on top of that, what I did at the time was just generate a random sequence of numbers to add to the data structure. And so when you do something like that, you use a pseudonym, pseudo random number generator. And in order for the test to be deterministic, you use a fixed C for the pseudo random number generator. Now, if you use runs per test, what this feature allows you is to vary the random seed. So each run will actually test a different permutation of insertions into your data structure. Now, this is a little bit out there, right? Not everyone uses this every day, obviously. Uh, but this is something to maybe, maybe to keep in mind. There is this feature. Um, if you have randomized testing strategy, this might be useful in combination with runs per test. Number 12, coverage. So everyone knows coverage, but no one's using it. No, I don't know. Who here is using coverage? OK, but excellent. Uh, I would say that somewhere between 10 and 25%, um, maybe more on the low end. Pete, you didn't raise your hand. But I can tell you, we have coverage inspections in our read native file, in our main repository. Um, and they're very simple. They're I, I basically copy pasted them from our internal documentation. Uh, you basically just run Bazel coverage, and then you can run gen HTML to generate an HTML report. There are, unfortunately, a lot of caveats with coverage. What's funny? Not using coverage. The new rule chair. Uh, we got it to work with the old rules Node.js, um, but uh, we just recently migrated to the new ones. I haven't tested it yet with coverage. Anyway, coverage is a very complex topic, and there is a lot to be said about this. Um, probably a separate talk. Um, but let's, let's take a look at what this looks like. Um, this is the, the coverage report generated by GenHTML. So you can see you know, this is a very simple unit test. Uh, it's a Java unit test. It just has used a single package that is under test, the options package. Um, 
unfortunate gen HTML doesn't give us a full path here, uh, which is a little bit wonky. But then it also shows us, uh, it, it actually also shows us HTML of the source code, and it, it color codes the parts that are covered or not covered. Here, I've only showed you the covered parts. Uh, there are a few red lines in, in this source file that aren't completely covered. Uh, this can happen, uh, right, even if you're aiming for, aiming for 100% coverage may not be the right thing for everyone. Uh, it may be the right thing for some people, may not be the right thing for everyone. Uh, there are a few cases in Java specifically where you have to add like a try catch block, um, but you know it can never actually throw, and so you can't actually write a test for it, right, because you would have to like, load like a broken class file in order to get it to fail. And that's just so much effort that it's not worth it to get to 100% coverage, especially because you expect it to literally never happen, ever. Yes, there are more questions here. Infections, you can, uh, if this is because of check inspections, the solution would be Kotlin, right? Yes, yes. Uh, not every language is susceptible to this kind of problem. Uh, Java's checked exception is certainly. I like checked exemptions, um, but uh, not everyone does, and it's certainly a question of how you use them. They're not always the right answer. So, first caveat of coverage is instrumentation filter, and this is the easiest one to get wrong, unfortunately, because Basil guesses an instrumentation filter. OK, I have to backtrack a little bit here. Why doesn't Bazel just compute coverage for everything? The reason is Bazel is used in very, very large code bases. And in some of these very large code bases, instrumenting everything with coverage is not possible. Um, for C++, for example, the coverage is baked into the binary. And there are cases where the binary size goes from under 4 gigabytes to over 4 gigabytes and no longer fit into a 32-bit address space. So in those cases, you can either not run coverage at all or you have to use a subset. And so Bazel has gone the way of saying, OK, we're, only, we're always going to only instrument a subset of the code for coverage. We're never going to instrument everything. Um, and so the way that was, so that what the people on the team decided before Bazel was open source, when Bazel was made open source, uh, this was adjusted a little bit. Um, and Bazel guesses an instrumentation filter based on the top level targets passed on the command line. These, I don't know about you, but they, said they were never the right targets for me. So um, what can you do? Um, what you can do is, number one, is Bazel will actually tell you what the instrumentation filter was. Uh, in this case, I was running Bazel coverage test Java com enchflow options, and the guest instrumentation filter is main Java com enchflow options. Um, and main indicates this is a standard layout for Maven projects. Now, I also made the unfortunate decision to not use the Maven layout for this project. So there is actually no code that is covered by this instrumentation filter. If we're running, if we were running with the default instrumentation filter, it would just return an empty coverage report. My recommendation is, and your mileage may vary, but my recommendation is, at least for smaller projects, is to put a default instrumentation filter into your Bazel RC. Uh, this happens to be the, the one that we're using. Um, this depends on what the layout of your project is. If, if the default instrumentation filter works for you, that's, of course, fine. I'm not complaining about that. Um, but it goes wrong. Uh, we've seen it go wrong more often than not. Um, it, it mostly depends on where are your tests relative to your binaries. Some languages are different than others. In Java, you typically have a separate tree for your. Sorry, I'm talking about Java so much. I know people don't always like Java, but I've been doing a lot of Java development in my uh, professional career, so I talk about Java a lot. Um, in Java, typically, the layout is the source files in a different tree from the tests. And so the guess is you know, wrong as often as it's not. Uh, Go is different. In Go, typically, the tests are right next to the, to the source code. Uh, C++ is in a similar situation. But you may also have integration tests. 
And when you have integration tests, they are often in a different directory. And so Bazel cannot know which, which code you actually want to know about. Um, on a small project, you can set this to everything. Um, try it out. If it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, then you will need to set it to something. Next one. Unfortunately, Bazel coverage doesn't work out of the box for remote execution. And we wrote documentation for how to work around that, at least for Java and C++, at least for the last few Bazel versions. Um, wanted to, as a last caveat, I wanted to talk about multi-language tests. Um, this is not that typical to have multi-language tests, but it can happen, especially when you have larger integration tests um, where you, I don't know, you bring up a microservice and you run a web UI, you want coverage for both your service code and your UI code. Bazel supports this in principle. Unfortunately, I haven't seen a lot of cases where people actually did that successfully. It's very tricky to get this right. Um, the idea is, and unfortunately, part of the problem is that the coverage infrastructure is very fragmented. Pretty much every language comes with its own coverage tooling, and every coverage tool comes with its own coverage format. And so putting things into the same format and unifying these things is not straightforward. Um, Bazel and Google have decided to go with the ELCO format. So it's basically the, for the built-in languages in Bazel, Java and C++, um, the, there is code already shipped with Bazel, which automatically converts your profile to ELCO format, and then they can all be merged as one. For Python, there was recently upstream Python uh, LCOV support for the PyCov tool. Um, and in the process of being upstreamed into Bazel, I believe. That's it about coverage. This could, this could really be a full talk. Um, but given that only 10% of people raised their hand, I'm not sure how, how interesting it is for the rest. The last one, number 13, flaky test attempts. This is, again, the strategy of managing your flaky tests rather than like filing bugs and fixing them immediately. Um, and the, the idea is that you can uh, retry a test. So if a test fails, all right, let me get back a little bit more. Uh, sometimes you can, you can annotate a test as flaky. Um, and then you can set the flaky test attempts flag, which defaults to three. And if your test is marked as flaky, then after the first run, if that run fails, it will run again. And so often until you have exhausted the number of attempts. Um, and for more flexibility, you can also set a regex here, so you can set different numbers for different tests. Uh, this isn't something people typically do on the command line, but it could be done in a CI system. This is uh, the use case for which it was in initially implemented, where the CI system actually kept track of which tests were flaky, how flaky they were, and then specifically adjusted this number for different tests based on test history. Um, but yeah, having all that infrastructure is that's a fairly large amount of infrastructure in order to do that which, as far as I'm aware, doesn't exist off the shelf today. Hopefully soon. So should you use flaky test attempts or should you use run per test? Now, flaky test attempts are done sequentially, one after the other, and that can make your test take a lot longer. So hey, example, sorry. Oh, hey, sorry. So we just had yeah. a question um, yes. from Alex remotely. What's the regex use case here? In the previous the, slide, I think, the, or this slide, yeah. Yeah, the, reg, the, the regex use case isn't necessarily that it's a regex, the, this, this flag. I mean, the, the regex you use here could also just be the full target name. Um, and you can, on top of that, this is a list, list option. And both run per test and flaky test attempts are list options, so you can set them multiple times. And each time, you can set a different test. 
the, the fact that it's a regex just means that you can potentially merge some together into a single regex and then you don't have you have to don't have to list every single set target in each one. There is another question. Yeah. Uh, uh, one test matches multiple regex. I think I don't know. Because stress, it's either first one wins or last one wins. I'm pretty sure that it's one of the two. In both cases, that if one of the uh, multiple rounds fails, then it's much as late, you know, that's passed, or is it uh, behaving differently? So for the sequential case, this is this slide. Um, it, it runs the first attempt. If that passes, it's done. It marks it as passed. If the first one fails, it runs it a second time. If that passes, it marks it as flaky. Right? If it if you have a higher number, of course, it could potentially run it up to, I don't know, 100 times, 1,000 times, whatever. So in the first case, we're running sequentially. Um, but running sequentially can be very expensive. An example we have seen is that we were using um, a test framework for iOS tests. And this test framework was at least partially uh, written by Apple, and it had a failure rate where it just wouldn't start up. It would just hang. And we, had, we didn't have the source code. We had no way of fixing it. Um, and this was causing, what, right when a test hangs, it means you only find out that it failed after the timeout of the test, right? And your iOS test usually have a fairly high timeout. So if your timeout is five minutes, every one of the that hangs is a five minute run. And so if you happen to do that three times in a row, because it failed twice, you end up with a 15 minute time on your build. Oh, well, not, maybe not 15, but 10 plus an actual test run. Um, and that was at the time for the builds that we were looking at, that was about half of the typical end-to-end -end build time. Right, and that was just too expensive, um, and so we decided to use this interesting combination of flags. So you set runs per test, and again you can use it regex based or not. Then you set runs per test. So this means we run the test multiple times in parallel. All right, number one. Then we set runs per test to take flakes. So if one of the runs passes, the test is marked as flaky, not as failed. And then we set the third option, which is experimental cancel concurrent tests, where the first test that passes cancels the other runs. So you can basically kill the test and uh, get the, get the uh, resources back. Uh, first of all, Basil doesn't wait for the test to finish anymore. And secondly, you can get the machine back that you were running the test on, especially for Mac or iOS tests. These Macs can be a very expensive resource. There is a question back there. Isn't this also the case where you would want to enable the cache despite it being run split test? Yes, correct. Absolutely. I, sh I should have added the note for that here. So that's, that's why I mentioned that earlier. Uh, there is a cache test results flag in Bazel, which can be either no caching, automatic caching, or always caching. And if you're using this combination of test uh, flags to, to handle flaky tests, then adding, enabling, force enabling caching is a good idea because then you get the path faster um, and you don't have to run the tests when they actually just use up. You know, that's the entire point. Another question here. If you use the option with the sequential runs of the test, so the second one runs only if the first one fails, how does this work with sharding? Right. If you combine this with sharding, uh, each this applies to each shard separately. Uh, so, so let's say the first chart or the second chart. Let's say the second chart is run three times in parallel, um, and then it's marked flaky if one of them passes. At least one of them passes. And the other shards are canceled. Sorry, the other parallel runs of the same shard are canceled, but the other shards are not canceled. They're still so when you basically when you enable test sharding, it's as if you had written a build file with two test 
test rules. They are basically separate. Um, and this only applies for each shard. Does that make sense? What I, what I meant is that you are kind of dynamic uh, uh, queuing there, right? Because in the same shard, you will queue the second time only if the first time fails. Well, in, in this case, we're running the test in parallel, right? We're willing to spend the resources to run the test in parallel, um, even though, right, if we run it, like, like if, if, the, if the number of runs is, for example, we're running three in parallel, um, and then we're killing two when the first one is done. Um, it's, a, it's a waste of resources, for sure. Uh, but given the situation that we were in, where the tests were timing out after five minutes, or maybe even longer, um, it was worth it for us at the time, right? Again, this is a, a case of trade-offs. If you have if you have the machines, by all means do it. If you think it's too expensive, then you may have to make your developers wait. Okay. All right, that was the last one. Thank you, thank you all for coming. Any more questions about tests? So you have to implement all those features for all the different frameworks you support, right? So if there is no, if there is some new framework or you, you have to basically wait for you get. Yes, uh, these features are all, not all of them, but many of them are implemented in the test framework. And so if someone brings out a new test framework and they aren't considering the Bazel feature specifically, then um, you may have to file a feature request or you may have to patch it or you may have to add support yourself. Yeah. The, the stuff that shipped with Bazel, again, for Java and C++ supports pretty much all of these features. Any more questions? One question. Um, in the last slide, you were mentioning an iOS project where you use this trick of uh, using multiple runs per test. And you mentioned that it was happening in parallel. So if you put four there, you have four runs happening in parallel of the same test. Isn't that uh, really slow? Because setting up the test runner for iOS specifically and starting a test can take a while. And if it's happening in parallel, you are eating quite a lot of resources. I'm asking because in my setup, I have tests set in series, one after another. So it kind of makes sense because then you schedule the same test to run four times. And then the first one that succeeds will cancel the other one. But it will not happen in, in parallel. So you will not take all the resources when starting the test. So basically, yeah, the experience that like if you're running four in parallel, you're taking all those resources. Or not at all. Yes, um, it's a question of trading off resources against uh, potentially developer time, right? Um, one of the things you can do is you can try to figure out is this all right? This is this is way advanced, right? Um, but in your CI system, sometimes you know that someone is waiting for these results, right? This is a pre-submit. The pre submit, you know, you have a pull request, you're running pre submit, the pull request already has uh, an approval, um, right? Maybe you've even enabled auto merge on GitHub. At that point, you know this is waiting for the test to results, right? And so if you know that, maybe you can enable this and say, okay, I'm willing to waste some more machines on this so I get the results faster. Um, or you can also look at the current load on, on the cluster and you can say, well, you know, there isn't a lot of load right now. Let's just make it a little bit faster uh, so that people who get up early have a nicer experience. Okay, so basically, it's because you are thinking on remote execution. Yes, yes. So the, the, the example that I talked about with the iOS test runner specifically was using remote execution. And we had a bunch of Macs, and they're not going anywhere. If they're not used, then you know, yeah, they're just sitting around collecting dust, right? So you might as well use at least some of them uh, to make the builds faster. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we had a question from Jesse. Roughly how many languages support coverage presently? I know, I, I mean, I have successfully run coverage for Java, for C++, for Python, for Go, for JavaScript, although there are now new JavaScript rules that apparently don't support it yet. Kotlin is definitely covered as well. Pretty much any language that, that targets the JVM and uses the standard runner uh, should just work with uh, with the Java coverage 
if it's a Java coverage, that's the runtime implementation of the class files. Uh, so basically, you get it for if you target the JVM, you get it for free. Those are the ones that I can I can just talk about from the top of my head. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are more, but I can't think of any right now. So in, in terms of uh, so Frank Rosillo is asking, how usable is the overall support for Kotlin? How usable is the overall support for Kotlin? I don't know. Does anyone want to comment on that? Since we have people here, is anyone using Kotlin extensively? Two years ago, it was pretty good. Yeah, I, we know that some very large organizations are using and, and improving the Kotlin rules. And so my expectation for Kotlin is that the support is, for, for Basil at least, is very good. Um, one thing that we have seen in the past is that the Kotlin compiler isn't quite as fast. Um, there was actually a, uh, a job listing from JetBrains uh, looking for a compiler expert to make the compiler faster. At least I saw that like half a year ago or so. I should note that we do have a, the original Kotlin rules author here in the room as well. So if anyone's interested in talking to. Thanks for the reminder. There is another question. Like, uh, last time I checked, the only way you could use workers with tests was um, by using uh, the built-in Java rules. Mm. Is that still the case? And do you know if it's going to change anytime in the future? So the question is about test workers. Um, I didn't talk about persistent workers today. I did talk about them in my last talk. Um, the idea of persistent workers is that when you run an action, for example, a compiler, um, the compiler does a bunch of work at startup. Um, you know, depending on which language it's for, it might load the standard library, might load other things. Um, and throwing that work away is a little bit of a waste. Uh, and so ideally, you want to keep the compiler running. And the first language that we implemented that for in Basil happens to be Java, um, in part because the Java, Java compiler, the Java compiler that is written in Java um, uh, has very high startup overhead um, and is a lot faster if you can reuse it. Um, and our experience there was that uh, this could make Java builds four times faster or something like that. And so we implemented that, and then it got adopted for other languages, and it's pretty cool. Um, and then at some point, we thought, what's still missing here? Right? We're looking at the, at the engineering like, work flow where an engineer modifies some code, runs a test, modifies some code, runs a test. Um, what about the tests? Right? Sometimes test startup has a lot of overhead. Sometimes the test does a lot of setup. Maybe it runs a Docker container that it pulls from the internet or, or something else. Um, and so we thought maybe we can use the persistent worker concept also for tests. And we built a prototype. A colleague of mine, not me personally, a colleague of mine at Google, built a prototype and got some experimental results for Java tests. And it's Basically, what you expect from your Java, if you're a Java developer, is what do you expect from your Java IDE, right? Running the test in a separate process takes two seconds. Running it incrementally in the same process takes 10 milliseconds, right? It's literally several orders of magnitude faster. Unfortunately, uh, the colleague who worked on it um, didn't ship a complete implementation and never finished the work and eventually left the team. Um, and unfortunately, I cannot say what the Basel team is planning to do with that code. Uh, the code still exists, at least parts of it still exist. Um, but as far as I'm aware, it's not really usable right now, which is very unfortunate. But it, it basically can give you an, an IDE experience with very, very fast test run, turnaround time in your terminal, in your Basel terminal. And if you combine that with a tool like iBasil, which automatically watches for file saves, you basically you, you save your file and you immediately get the results in your terminal or in your UI. But there, there is more work needed there. Um, and I, I, I'm reluctant to make a prediction on how long it will take. Sorry. 
Last chance to ask a question. Are there other coverage reports available besides HTML? So the way coverage works in Bazel is Bazel runs the test, and the test outputs coverage data in some form. And then there is a tool that ships with Bazel right now uh, that is run over the coverage data that can post-process it and merge it. Right? If you have a, an integration test which actually runs multiple binaries in the same in the same tests, then you may have multiple coverage files. And so the idea is that this tool can merge all of them uh, and then write them to a single output file. Again, as I said earlier, Bazel actions require that all the output files are named. And so it only has like one file where all the coverage data has to go, which is fine, right? You, we want to merge the coverage data anyway. So you know, just merge it into a single file. That's fine. That part is fine. Um, and then there is a, a second step afterwards where Bazel takes all of the coverage data from all the tests it ran and uses um, I want to say it used the same tool, but it's probably not true. It probably used a separate tool uh, to merge those. And then that's the output file from Bazel. Uh, there is code in Bazel to run an, a report generator like GenHTML, uh, but that part of the code is not functional right now, and so it requires that you do it manually. Now, in principle, you can plug in whatever tools you want to do the coverage processing and merging. Um, in practice, I haven't seen anyone do that for anything other than Elkov. Uh, in theory, it can be done, and you can use pretty much any tool chain as long as you can generate, a, you know, a unified coverage format. Or you can, you, you know, it, you don't have to get coverage for everything. Maybe you only want to get coverage for Go tests or only for Rust tests, um, it should be possible to use the, the language-specific tools to process the coverage and get a report out. Um, but me personally, I've never actually tried that. Um, and so I haven't, I haven't seen it successfully done. There has been some work to make that easier to use. Um, so as I said, originally, Bazel could only have a single output file. There is an experimental flag in Bazel where it will pull back an entire coverage directory. So you're no longer restricted to a single file. You can have multiple files in there. You don't have to do the merging as part of the test action. You can just do it after the fact, uh, offline, whatever. Um, and so if you enable that, it shouldn't be too hard to get a coverage report uh, with whatever tool you want. But you may have to convince Bazel to not try to merge anything. No more questions. Thanks, everyone.